Dobry ranak. So I'll switch to English now because my Ukraine is uh, up to no good. And uh, probably in the evening I'll learn only the bad words. So uh, obviously you already know I'm Casper. Um, because most people in the UK tend, me call, tend to call me up and call me Casper, not Kaspar, as it's said in Estonia. Um, I'm the founder of Browserbyte, which is uh, a cross-browser testing tool for layout problems, uh, which this speech is uh, about. It's the journey, how we developed this application in the early days and uh, what challenges we actually met doing that. I'm also currently uh, employed in the financial sector. I'm helping Danske Bank to migrate a lot of data from uh, a bunch of systems to one big system, which is basically a, a organized chaos. Uh, I'm also the chair of uh, Nordic Testing Days and the president of uh, ISTQB in Estonia, so uh, I know a few things about certification as well. So uh, if you feel that this conference is not enough and you want more, uh, although as a conference organizer I have to say this has been brilliantly organized so far, uh, you're welcome to Tallinn next week for Nordic Testing Days as well, which is the biggest conference in testing in uh, in the Nordic and uh, Scandinavian and Baltic region. So, on to the business. Yeah. So, uh, how many of you have actually uh, are managing or have ever managed the web page or website? Please raise your hand. So a few. I was expecting a lot more. So. I'll, I'll run a little uh, test by you right away. But basically, the trouble with most websites, uh, about in 2000, 2001, when I was studying in university, um, we ran a small website development company as students with uh, uh, three of my friends. And uh, back then, we had browsers like Internet Explorer 4, um, some really exotic stuff. You had stuff like Netscape and so on. And uh, getting the website to work on these browsers was a real pain. So you could get it to work on one, but then you had to, you know, check it out on the other and so forth, on and so forth. So later in 2007, I started a QA company focused on testing, and and we started getting customers who had exactly the same problem. So they were having websites or web applications and they just didn't render right. They didn't look right in uh, different uh, computers at the time. And, uh, you know, we, we, spent, we sold testing, testing consultancy. Obviously, that was a lot of hours. That was good for business. And, uh, you know, the more hours you sell, the better off you are. But at one point, you see that people are getting tired of this. Because, I mean, it's seven years later, and still all the browsers are working differently. And uh, you still have to manually go through the web applications or web pages. So there has to be a better way. So in 2007, yeah, we probably might remember that, yeah, this was the year when iPhone was launched. And, uh, you know, ten years later now, we've got all sorts of uh, devices out here, everything running all sorts of browsers. But the fundamental problem that we found was that while we were selling manual testing, we were selling the service of detecting bugs, detecting issues. Um, that was actually much harder than uh, one would anticipate. So this is um, a website of... Uh, it's. Some of you who are in the startup world might know this company, but it's called Seedcamp, and uh, their whole goal is to attract as many uh, potential founders and founders of startups, and uh, the good ones they will uh, fund a little. So uh, we participated there as well, and uh, we, we tested their website. And this is now your test, 
Uh, if you notice the difference, don't mention it to anyone. So this is a good rendering. Okay? This is uh, how this website is supposed to look like. Have a good look. You're, you're all testers, aren't you? Who's working as a tester or a test manager or in the, in the business? Raise your hand. Well, good. We are in a proficient crowd. So you had a good look. All right. Now I will show... Oops, wrong button. Oh, this is classic. Yeah. So this is an inter Internet Explorer 9. That's, a, that's an old website. Don't worry. And now, this is how it looked like in Internet Explorer 8. I mean, back then it was a bad, bad browser. I mean, it, it was very hard to get things working on it. Who can see the problem? Okay, fonts. What else? Buttons. What buttons? Which, up there, in the menu? Text in search field is wrong. What else is wrong? Well, it's Internet Explorer. Everything is wrong, yeah? <laughs> well, actually, this is the hard part. A lot of people see different things. So, obviously, the text in the search box is moved up a little. But it kind of works. You get what it, you know. It doesn't look all that pretty, but it works. The fonts are different, but again, so what? Actually, the place where this company makes the money from is here. You can't see it very well. It says apply here. They actually, the whole point of this whole page is that the startup founder would click this button, and if you didn't see it before, I'll uh, go back. Now, this is the important thing. This is where the money is. And uh, I think out of this crowd, maybe three, four people noticed it. Honestly, who noticed it before I told you? Okay, very good. So now you see what I mean by um, testing is hard. It's very hard to notice layout problems, especially when you've got so many things to look at. Now, imagine doing this 10 times in a row. You get slide after slide. You have Firefox, you have Internet Explorer 8, Internet Explorer 9, Internet Explorer 10, Internet Explorer 11, then you've got Edge, then you've got Firefox, Chrome, Safari, all the versions, and you'll fall asleep pretty soon. So, how can we go about it? So, actually, talking about money, back then, Seedcamp actually missed 20% of the market. So if this was a buy now button in Amazon, you would lose about 20% of the uh, revenue because customers don't find the button. Uh, Expedia, which is uh, one of the biggest travel sales websites, um, they discovered the problem in their uh, form. That was back in 2012 where in Firefox, the Buy Now button, or Book Now button, in their case, was shifted across a column to an uh, upper right corner. So the customers didn't find the bu button when they were using Firefox. When they fixed it, their monthly revenue went up $12 million in a month. So cross-browser problems can be quite expensive, especially when you have scale. So. Big companies are also not, who have the funds and money, uh, they are not safe from uh, cross-browser issues. I mean, when Apple launched their new iPad, that wasn't the, the original iPad, but the newer version of it, then uh, in Firefox 3.6, which was quite used at the time, I think they had about 10% market share, something like that. This was how Apple's web page look like in Firefox on the left. It's uh, very uh, Apple-like. It's clean. <laughs> but um, 
why was it so hard even for Apple to uh, you know, do this? It's just you need to do some multiplication. And I hear that here in Ukraine you're also very good in math. Because you also have the Olympiads like we do in Estonia. It's the legacy of the uh, Soviet Union, I suppose. So I ask you to do some math with me. Because I'm not that good. So first of all, it's, it's a variation multiplication. So you have to find all the variations out there. And uh, so you've got operating systems. iOS, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, all the versions under it. So how many can you get if you multiply it up with all the versions? A lot. Thank you very much. This is Ukrainian mathematics I hear. <laughs> so uh, next one is up devices. So for instance, you've got now the iPhone 7, but there's also the Samsungs, there's the Sonys, there's the Huawei's, you name it. And these devices have variations. So you've got the iPhone and you've got the iPhone Plus. Uh, then you've got the firmware versions because they get updates. And they all work differently. Then you go to resolutions. Okay, with computers, you've got the the laptop, for instance, the resolution, then you might use a big screen. Then, uh, for instance, my programmer uses the screen tilted in uh, portrait mode. Uh, the phones have got different resolutions. Plus, you multiply it up with pixel scaling. So whoever is using, for instance, Windows 10 or you're using Mac, you can, even though you have a number of pixels on the screen, you can zoom in, basically. So, for instance, with iPhone, you have the normal and uh, a view which is called uh, for old people who, have, who don't have uh, long enough hands or are simply long-sighted. So, and in the end, you've got the browsers and then you've got the browser versions. So, according to Ukrainian mathematics, a lot times a lot times a lot times a lot times a lot. So it's a lot on a... Uh, what is it, the, um, the stepping? So basically, it's about exponential, yeah, sorry. So a lot exponential to a, to a factor of four or five or six, depending on how many factors you take in. So actually, in, a, in real life, when you would take an average website and you want to test it, you're dealing with a minimum of about 100 variations which are relevant to the market because... At one point, it just goes out down so narrow. The market shares are very, very narrow. But uh, today, we are sp speaking about uh, a very clustered market in that sense. There's a lot of devices out there, a lot of uh, variations. And this is hard to manage and very hard to test. So we figured that if people are so bad, I mean, you just looked at two browsers, and you couldn't find the most important bug on that website. So imagine looking at 100. So this task is clearly inhuman. And uh, so back then in the days, I gave my little team a little task. In their spare time, they investigated how to uh, automate layout testing so that this is the part we can sell to our customers that we can automate. Because if you go to a customer and say, well, we'll automate it, then uh, they're willing to give out more money, even more than in manual testing in some cases, because it's faster. And uh, we found out all the problems that actually stop us from going forward because the easiest solution you might think of is that you take two screenshots, you do pixel by pixel comparison, and uh, you're home free, right? Well, unfortunately, you all know, you know pixel by pixel doesn't work quite right, so we had to find other means. And uh, while finding out these means, we found out a lot about what browsers do. First of all, browsers do gradients differently. So when you look at the website, it usually contains images. And even though the source image is the same, the way how the browser renders it on the screen of the actual device is different. So this is the first reason why pixel by pixel comparisons don't work. So even if your website contains only one image and you compare Chrome to Firefox to Edge, 
you get different results. And uh, you might not see it here, but the way this is computer uh, graphical processing, but uh, there are techniques like anti-aliasing, dithering, and so on. And you see that there are very sharp edges here when the gradient is changing from one color to another. So this is turned into a heat map. And here are, it's, it's more dithered here. So pixel by pixel doesn't work. Then we had this fun thing is that, you know, we know developers. They write correct code all the time. It's standards compliant. And it's, you know, if it compiles, it works everywhere. Um, well, browser vendors actually know that, excuse the language, but the stuff that the, co the code, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript that the developers are, and in most cases, script kiddies are writing, that is no good. So there are algorithms in place to detect common mistakes and fix them in the browser. So if you forget to add the ending tag in HTML, Internet Explorer happily will inject it for you there and uh, render the site as if nothing is wrong. Whereas some, some browsers are more, let's say, stringent, rigid, and they won't display anything because you know, the HTML is broken. And uh, we started looking at, can we actually run this comparison based on code? Can we detect common patterns that cause errors in layout? So we just look at code. We detect that, hey, you're using this JavaScript construct. And uh, it's very likely that you're going to have an error in Safari because this won't work in Safari. That was a brilliant idea, I'll tell you that because it didn't work, because the reason why it didn't work was that most websites use JavaScript libraries, which make use of the defects that the browsers contain. So they're continuously making calls. Uh, basically, if, if you want to know if this browser is Internet Explorer 9 or 10, you make a call in JavaScript to a DOM object. If it doesn't exist, it must be Internet Explorer 9. This is how JavaScript works in real life. And all of the libraries that are usually attached to websites are making use of these malfunctions. So basically, they are making errors on purpose to detect the browsers. Therefore, you can't write, say that, hey, you're using this error because it won't work in Internet Explorer because it's not supposed to work in Internet Explorer and the code is making use of it. So it's reverse logic, sort of. So that's why code detection based uh, layout rendering deficiency detection doesn't work. So off to new territories. Then we started talking to uh, designers, graphic designers and uh, uh, web developers. And we found out that an interesting thing how people, you know, detect font differences. A number of you named that the fonts are different in the first two pictures that we land, ran this little experiment on. <laughs> so uh, we took a bunch of websites and asked people, you know, do you see anything uh, wrong? And just basically talking to people. So when you talk to designers, web designers, I mean, they are maniacs when it comes to font. The font has to be right. It has to be right on every device and yada, yada, yada. Pixel, you know, everything needs to be pixel perfect. Then you go and talk to some backend developer. They don't care. It's just the text is there. It doesn't matter if it's blue or black or brown. Text is there. You can read it. Go home. <laughs> and if you put the designer and this uh, backend developer in one room, then you know you get two completely different opinions about exactly the same issue. So who makes the call usually is the project manager, and their uh, tolerance level is somewhere in the middle. So in testing, usually it's very easy in functional testing. You put the input, you get output, and you have expected output. So you compare real output to the expected output. 
fail or pass, period. Not like that in layout testing. There's uh, like 50 shades of gray there it's, uh, in between. So in most websites you look at, the font is wrapped, uh, due to the font problems, it's wrapped differently. So, uh, and most people are actually uh, quite fine about it. They don't make a fuss out of it. Another reason why pixel by pixel comparison won't work. Then we discovered a next challenge, is that why manual testing, manual layout comparison doesn't work at all, is that our brain contains a lot of error correction algorithms. So you've probably all seen this uh, on Facebook and God knows where, where you have a long sentence that according to the scientists in Oxford that when you swap out all the letters inside uh, a word, you can still read it because the error cor correction mechanism inside our brain just you know, fixes everything when we look at it. And this is how it is. Actually, we are living in a augmented reality already and this reality is created by our brain. Because when we go around, you're not able to see what's in here, but you actually know what's in here because your brain fills the gap. Because you remember what was there about two seconds ago because when you looked at it, it, it you know, fits into your model. And the same problem applies in website testing. When you have looked at the same website five times over, you just stop noticing bugs because you know that this menu in the footer, it always has been there, it always has been black, and you don't notice when suddenly some of the titles disappear. You just don't notice it because your brain has already filled it in. It's already there in your brain, but not on the website. <laughs> then we started looking at, okay, we can't you know, use HTML to cut things up, so how do people actually do layout testing uh, in the rare occasions when they do detect bugs? And uh, what we found out is that people look at websites not as like in HTML, because on HTML you've got a lot of layers. So they look at blocks. So, so we took rendering uh, and we used a te technique which is called, in computer vision, it's called segmentation. So it's, it's the computer is trying to see the website as a human being would cut it up. So basically the challenge is uh, similar to uh, a three-year-old kid with a newspaper and uh, scissors and cut all the pictures out of the magazine and the text box. So we tried to do the same with the computer, but the computer vision is still in its early days and uh, it's literally looking at things pixel by pixel. Uh, it's very hard. But we somehow did it, so we, we took this is the same website in different uh, browsers and we just animated it uh, to make this uh, segmentation to see how the blocks in different browsers look like. And from that we got an idea to move further because we can compare these blocks and, and find out if the issues are present or not. And uh, detecting these blocks we found that these font differences, you know, they actually sometimes they do matter. In most cases, people don't care. That's when the text is small. But when the text is big, it does matter because then it's part of the design. Because when you have you know, half a screen full of letters and uh, it's wrapped wrong, it, it starts to look wrong. So our conclusion was that big text that does affect visual layout, has a, you know, we should detect it as a problem. Small text, no problem, at least usually unless the designer is a really picky one and, uh, and there are no back-end developers in the team. You've probably all seen this picture, yeah? Once in your lifetime. What's on the picture? Two faces. Is it the face or a vase? It depends. I like this guy is a tester. Well, does it pass or fail? Depends. Uh, <laughs> so, 
So uh, yeah, actually people do see things differently. And uh, this is the hardest part when you're building an automation tool in a space where pass and fail has a lot of shades in, in between. So we ran an experiment. We, uh, I took five people from my company. We gave them 50 websites and renderings of two browsers. And uh, they all had to work through them individually and report back any layout problems they find. Just to be sure, we made sure that one browser is Chrome and the other one was, I think, Internet Explorer 6 back in the day. So basically, we took the oldest used, really used uh, Internet Explorer. Actually, when Internet Explorer 6 came out, it was the most modern and best browser you could buy. And you didn't even have to buy it. So the outcome was uh, devastating especially when you're a manager of a QA consultancy that sells testing uh, as a service. Because in real life, only one tester out of three found an issue, whereas the issue was really present. So in order to get a, a reasonable detection rate when doing manual layout testing, you needed to put three people individually on the same job. And if you wanted to be absolutely sure, five people on the same job. So, and how layout testing is normally done is that, you know, we had our, you know, we have this guy in the corner, he's got some spare time, he'll take a quick look. And this is how it's done. It's completely useless, actually, doing it this way. You have to crowdsource if you want to do it manually. That's the short message here. Um, we also ran the experiment with a company called Playtech, which is developing uh, gambling platforms for uh, internet casinos and sports betting sites. And they have a team of professional layout testers. So these guys are looking at cherries day in and out. I mean, they are doing this for a living. It turns out that they were pretty bad, but they were still about two times better than an average uh, functional tester, so to speak. So if you're doing it day in and out, you can get better. But it's not a really fun job, I'll tell you that. So we set out to build a tool. Let's automate this. Let's automate the hell out of it and uh, you know, get it done with. So the tool was simple. You put in the website address. It will launch a bunch of browsers, take screenshot renderings, compare them to a baseline, and spit out a report. Uh, if you want to try it out, you can go to browserbyte.com and try it out yourself. But what is important here is that we had to benchmark this tool against something. So the best benchmark was uh, people. So we first, you have to look at quality. So, uh, you know, does the tool find issues uh, at least on a comparable level uh, to a human being? It's the same thing as uh, is going on with uh, uh, autonomous driving, so self-driving cars. So what you're comparing the self-driving car to is an average driver. And we all know that we are above average drivers, right? Correct? Well, because all research, when people are asked, well, what do you think? You're a below average driver, average driver, or above average driver? Then 90% of people are above average drivers which means the rest 10% are real morons. But that's a different story. My point is that most people think they are very good, where actually the truth is somewhere else. So in this case, we could get an objective measure. So we tested the manual testing, and then we compare it to uh, how the computer is doing. We use the segmentation, bunch of computer vision difference techniques uh, in order to detect two types of differences. Position differences, that means the button is still there, but it's moved around too much. I think uh, we use the threshold of uh, 20 pixels. In real life now we use more complex measures. And another one was visual, that means you know the button was missing, wrong color, you know, completely out of out of picture. And uh, 
the red column is the uh, basically the computer. Black column is a reference group, uh, which means it's all the testers we used combined. So this was crowdsourcing. Yeah. The green one is average tester. So one tester alone, one man army. Yeah. And the gray one was that first the tool ran through it, presented a report, and the manual tester would you know, thoroughly go through the uh, uh, results. So what we found was that the, the tool wasn't all that bad. It was, you know, it was actually, in some cases, it was better than the average tester. Uh, it was, it's still very hard to beat crowdsourcing. Uh, in terms of visual differences, back then, uh, you know, Razobot wasn't performing as well. So in quality, our goal was to be about 80% of average tester, and we reached it with the first iteration. So, great success. Then you have to look at false positives and false negatives. Whoever is in science, uh, especially in, in medicine, when you're detecting something, you get false positives and you get false negatives. So, false positive is that, hey, it's a bug. Actually, it's not. False negative is there is a bug, but you missed it. So, as you see, false positives, pretty average, you know, all across the board. It's in, in, in the range of statistical insignificance. And false negatives, this is where automation is, uh, is sometimes more eager than you wish. So, you know, some of the French cars will blink at anything in the dashboard when you drive around because there's always something happening. It's too sensitive. And this is what the tool was. It was, for most people, it was too sensitive. It was detecting too many issues that, in real life, are of little relevance. But uh, it turns out an average tester raises the flag sometimes also too often, saying that, you know, I'm sorry, I'm mixed up. So false negative means that the average tester misses about the same amount of bugs that the automated tool would miss. So, in that sense, if you have a choice between automation or, or uh, just throwing somebody alone at the job, quality-wise, you end up about the same. Now let's talk about speed. Uh, there's nothing really to compare. To do the same job, the machine back then used about 13 minutes. I think we used 50 sites and uh, uh, I think 13 browsers. The average tester used a total of two hours to go through the same number of sites and just two browsers. And uh, we actually had prepared the screenshots for the tester, so you didn't have to open up Internet Explorer, you didn't have to open up Chrome. So on average, automation actually sped up the whole process by about a factor of 30. So this is when we decided that, hey, this is some, something interesting, let's do a startup. But that's a whole different story, and uh, not about today. So, as a conclusion, through this journey, what we learned was that first, if you do layout testing, and uh, the website is generating some money in some form or another, it actually pays off to do it, because the revenue you might be missing out, uh, in most cases, is too big. Secondly, is that browser vendors, they, they deliver bugs like hell. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, two years ago, Chrome did an update that broke, about, broke the font renderings of about 20% of websites. And it, you know, fired up in our uh, tool because, you know, suddenly you started getting a lot of problems. It, it felt like as, as if our algorithm was starting to behave wrong. What had happened is that Chrome update came in, websites started rendering differently. Chrome is the golden standard. So this is the reference you compare everything else to. And if the golden standard changes, the e everything else starts to report errors. And uh, all of a sudden, it turns out what changed, Chrome changed font rendering on Windows. It started to use 
Windows tools instead of their own internal tools in Chromium. So tool vendors are making a lot of fun with the evergreen browser updates because if you today develop the website, it renders fine on Chrome. Might not be the case tomorrow because everybody gets the same browser update and it breaks your site. So you have to do it continuously. You can't do it, you know, we deployed it, it's tested, we're good. Now, next week, test again. So that it's good news for you. It's a lot of work coming up. Um, third point, we already told you, even though it's a lot of work, believe me or not, but you will be pretty bad at it. So trust the machines. And best practical combination is actually run the automation and then filter the, the results. Because when it comes to layout testing, you, you cannot put it into a fully automated, uh, let's say, continuous delivery tooling. So it, you can't have simply a, like a pipeline of, you know, we run the functional test, then we run the layout test. If no errors, we can deploy to live. Because layout testing is more, um, it requires more finesse. So you need to have uh, some sort of a human filter at the moment, at least in front of it. You can do simplified layout tests, but it's, it's uh, still challenging. So, I am pretty much done. Maybe you have some questions. Go. I'll give you the mic. Uh, I have an interesting question. Uh, last day I read an article about a uh, new statistic of using the browsers, and now uh, Chrome is the first place. And uh, do you believe that in, that in future we don't have this problem with browsers because we will have only two, one or two main browsers? What is your opinion about it? That was an excellent question because uh, I think back in uh, back in 2008, I tried to employ a very talented guy in computer vision, and uh, when I explained to him, you know, what we're doing and uh, the challenges we have, the guy thought about it like five minutes and said, "Well, now I'm not going to join you." I said, "Why? Why not?" Well. This is a problem created by browser vendors, yeah, in reality, because they don't stick to standards. Everybody makes up their own standards. And they will fix it. And I, I told them, <laughs> yeah, right, because uh, browsers have been in development since, n you know, 1995, 94, when the first, when the internet basically started, or World Wide Web. And since that time, there's always been innovation. And there were times where Netscape had 95% of the market. There were times when Internet Explorer had the same market share. There was, now is the time for Chrome. And uh, there will, something new will come up. I've been in the business long enough to see that tides will change. In 2006, nobody thought about uh, calling with an iPod, yeah? Well, now it's quite a different story. So I'm pretty sure that looking at how Chrome, Chrome has gone worse, but they've now picked themselves up again. The same applies for Microsoft, because um, I've been talking to the uh, Internet Explorer development team before they were shut down, and they started you know, working on Edge. And, and um, in reality, the, all these big companies are reinventing themselves if they want to stay in the market. And if they reinvent, they will come up with something new and it will topple the market around again. So in, in that sense, browser is the new platform to develop on anyway. So, uh, and I, I'm sure we will see more innovation and therefore more issues. <laughs> so this problem is not going to go away, unfortunately, I'm afraid. Because uh, when we look at the World Wide Web, uh, this consortium web that sets the standards, there's a constant bloody fist fight going on in there. So, unfortunately, uh, no candy. But that means that we all will have a job, you know. <laughs> Huge applause to Kaspar.